Greetings, I'm Michael Quinn Patton, the author of the book Blue Marble Evaluation and one of the leaders in the Blue Marble Evaluation Network. We came at this as a way of making evaluation useful to programs and initiatives that are working to transform how the world works. As evaluators, there's a long history of trying to increase the effectiveness of programs. And we say that evaluation grew up in the projects, evaluating projects and programs. But now we're living in a world where we're having to attend to changing systems. And that's a very different challenge. With the pandemic going on, with systemic racism a challenge, with climate change a challenge, Moving to systems change presents very different challenges of understanding how global trends affect local things, of looking across the traditional silos that have been the basis of agencies and philanthropy and government to get a more holistic total systems perspective on the kind of changes that are needed. And that's what Blue Marble Evaluation brings to this. And so why call it the Blue Marble Evaluation Network? Well, Blue Marble is the name that was given to that iconic image of the Earth taken from the 1972 last Apollo mission from space, where for the first time we saw the whole planet with relatively few clouds, the home of all of humanity, our only home, and that got dubbed the Blue Marble. Blue Marble evaluation then takes that global perspective. And in working with global organizations, like the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, they have incorporated Blue Marble Evaluation and in fact have appointed the world's first Blue Marble Evaluator, who you're going to hear from now, Pablo Vidueira. Muchas gracias, Michael. Soy Pablo Vidueira. Eh, vivo en Madrid, en España, y bueno, soy la primera persona que ha trabajado como Evaluator. I am based in Madrid, Spain, and I work for the Global Alliance for the Future of Food which is a coalition of philanthropies working for food systems transformation together with others. To me, the term Blue Marvel really evocates this image from the Apollo mission where the Earth was revealed as a unit uh, and not as this set of separated entities that we created. So that very much reveals our connectedness and, and, and how we are one together. To me, Blue Marvel, it's basically different because it, it's able to pose different questions. To me, evaluation is all about the art and, and the science of being able to pose and respond meaningful questions, questions that, that allow us to make things differently, better, together, and for the meaningful transformation of, of systems. That's what is radical and, and new about Blue Marble, this, this ability to pose new questions. Um, there's a set in, in evaluation that says that whatever, you know, what gets measured gets done. And we tend to say also that what gets asked gets reflected upon. So, so that would be one of the big points for me. When I was finishing my PhD on, on evaluation, my frustration was seeing that using methods, no matter, no, no matter how fancy or how difficult they are, I was finding that they oftenly failed to support efforts to, to really create a meaningful change. Of course, at that time, I didn't have any of this systemic transformation language of, or, or any of that kind. And Blue Marvel Evaluation to me was a, a very important turning point in my understanding of evaluation because it, it, it helped me to move from the focus on methods and tools to placing the focus on questions. And that's a very important shift because no matter how you are using methods, if you are not posing the right questions, that's pointless. And usually that's a waste of time and resources to my experience. So since Blue Marvel evaluation started and the network was launched, we are now more than 600 people worldwide. Uh, one of them is my colleague Minji, who's now going to share some perspectives from her work on the UN Food Systems Summit. 
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Min Jae Cho. I'm an independent evaluator and also currently uh, pursuing a PhD in evaluation and applied research method at Claremont Graduate University. I'm also working for different types of evaluation in international development sector. Um, the reason I became a Blue Marvel evaluator is that, that I really love the core ideas of Blue Marvel evaluation, which try to bring different peoples to work across boundaries and try to break silos, um, which I believe is the most important things for evaluators. Um, and to to actually solve the wicked problems in this um, difficult current situation in the rapidly changing world. The history of evaluation was about social betterment. It's not about, okay, me, myself, going there and judging people that whether they did well or not, but it was actually more about helping people and let's improve this and let's make a better society. So if they really believe in that, and if they really believe that was the history of evaluation, I think the evaluators should try to use the Blue Marble evaluation approach. So you actually need to see those connecting dots, how that is connected to your program, and then how that is connected to other problems in the society and other factors in the society. So it's more about uh, the understanding systems that the program is situated in. So that really helped me to actually do the better evaluation and do the quality work for clients. The one thing that we missed out from traditional approach was that we only look at the program improvements, but we didn't see that how that program would affect to, to the other side of the society, how that would affect to the other programs. So how that is actually connected to other people. Um, so that was something that I realized that, oh, we actually need to look at that. We need to address even when we're doing the evaluation on a single program, but we still need to consider the other things. Okay, thank you. I will now pass it over to Debbie. Uh, my name is Deborah Kaddu, mm -hmm. and so, I'm a Ugandan, I'm in Uganda. and I'm an evaluator. I'm an empowerment evaluator and a member of the Blue Marble Evaluation Network. And my area of speciality is evaluating mainly development programs, especially that connect, that are related to the empowerment of women. My dream is to link the Africa Gender and Development Evaluators Network to the Blue Marble Evaluation um, community and principles and way of working so that we can be we can connect our work which resonates so much with so many women around the world and in particular the the women in the diaspora and I believe in the power of evaluation in transforming lives and leading to a life where people can live human beings can live with dignity and so all those factors attracted me to to Blue Marble to the Blue Marble Evaluation Network, and now I'm just so inspired. Yeah, that's the home for me. And now it's my real pleasure. It's such an honor to hand over to some of the pe one of the people who has really, really inspired me in this field of evaluation, a coach, a mentor, Donna Poddens. Debbie, thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Donna Podems and I am a Blue Marble Evaluator. I am here today to talk a little bit about how I use Blue Marble Evaluation in my own work. I am currently living in South Africa where I have been for the past 23 years. And I work primarily in Africa, although I also work in parts of Asia, Eastern Europe and North America. I'm really proud to be a member of the, the Blue Marble Evaluation Network. It brings a lot to me in my, my personal life because it resonates with my values. It brings a lot to me as a professor uh, in teaching my students, and it brings a lot to me as a practicing evaluator. 
For the past year, I've been working with Michael Quinn Patton on a very important project for the UN Food Systems Summit. I'm directing the Blue Marble Synthesis uh, team, uh, where we're looking at hundreds of independent dialogues that are taking place around the world that are focused on looking at dis different aspects of a food system. Some of the issues that have come up that we've seen over the past uh, six months, actually, in looking at this data, have been issues around how food is packaged in terms of the amount of plastic that gets into our oceans, to how women have difficulty in challenges in working in the agricultural sector because of the many barriers that they face. So um, I consider myself both a practitioner and an academic. Um, I do a lot of writing. I've written academic uh, evaluation books. But I'm primarily a practitioner and I work in the field. Um, there's many different kinds of evaluation that are out there. And although we as evaluators tend to draw on many different theories and approaches, I primarily draw on those that sit in, in an area of trying to bring about social change. Feminist evaluation is an area that I work in quite a bit. And I find that when you work with um, the more theoretical kinds of evaluation like democratic evaluation, feminist evaluation, and blue marble evaluation, is that they really don't tell you how to do the evaluation. They, they guide you, um, they inspire you, and they help you become a better evaluator. So the, the reason that blue marble evaluation resonates with me is because it resonates with my own values of how to how to bring about change through evaluation, whether that's through, um, through a training, through doing evaluation, or through trying to advocate with the findings. I think some of the challenges we run into as blue marble evaluators is that we can't just be advocates. And I think the value add that the blue marble theory brings uh, to being an evaluator is that it brings credibility. It brings us a transparent way to go about doing evaluation so that when we are advocating with our findings, um, we're bringing empirical evidence uh, to that. And I think that is a huge value um, with the Blue Marble approach. I also think that Blue Marble helps you think about how to be an evaluator from a social justice perspective. Um, an example is an evaluation I did uh, last year in the agriculture sector where we were working with farmers and we were trying to understand if this intervention had actually improved their income level and improved their livelihoods. Um, but what I noticed in, in this whole project is that they were being funded to bring in thousands of seedlings uh, to plant a new kind of, a new kind of vegetable, uh, a new kind of plant into where they, where they are currently living. And in bringing in all of those seedlings, they were transporting them in plastic. So I think as a blue marble evaluator, it's to think beyond the scope of what I was asked to do, which was to assess whether or not this was bringing about the outcome of intended improved livelihoods and to recognize that other parts of the project were damaging the earth um, and to bring those findings into my evaluation, um, even though it wasn't in my, in my scope. So to really, when I, when I implement feminist evaluation, I tend to bring in a theory or a way of looking at the world that's a little bit different because it brings in my feminist values. And when I combine that with blue marble evaluation, um, it brings in other kinds of guidance and other ways of thinking that make, um, that make the evaluation more relevant um, to what we're experiencing today in our world, which is global climate change. So I would like to introduce you to our next, uh, our next guest, which, who is Glenn Page. And he's going to talk to you about his experiences using Blue Marble Evaluation in other parts of the world. Well, thank you, Donna. My name is Glenn Page, and I'm the president and CEO of Sustainometrics and the global lead of COBALT, the Collaborative for Bioregional Action Learning and Transformation. And now what I'd like to do is just share a few stories to illustrate the how, the what, and the why of Blue Marble Evaluation. Geologists don't make headlines. If you think about the type of people geologists are, you don't often see them on the news or making any sort of headlines. Well, back in the year 2000, at the turn of the century, two geologists actually changed the world with a new name for the geological epoch that we're in right now. They refer to it as the Anthropocene. And this word is absolutely central to the work of Blue Marble Evaluation. 
what they basically said was is the entire earth systems and how the earth was serving as a life support function was changing and humans were the cause now that sent ripples throughout the academic community but it wasn't until june of 2011 when the economist actually had a headline that said welcome to the anthropocene and the caption read humans have changed the way the world works now they have to change the way they think about it too that is essentially the core of blue marble evaluation we have to now that we know we are the first generation that knows what we're doing to the earth the earth's life support system now the question is how do we think about it and how do we respond that's at the absolute core of blue marble evaluation it's a wake-up call it's a philosophy but it's rooted in evaluative rigor a set of wide set of conceptual frameworks and methods that you can apply based upon the context and the challenge. And it asks more of us, not just on our work, but also who we are individually, the inner dimensions. Basically the challenge and the question we need to ask is what are we as individuals, as collective communities, as societies, as a species, what are we capable of doing in response to this new knowledge? That is Blue Marble Evaluation. So recently, I just came back from a trip to the Amazon because there's a group of 11 indigenous nations who have come together as a dream, as a dream to come together and reimagine what it is to actually create a sovereign bioregional land at the headwaters and doing it in a sacred way in terms of protecting the headwaters of the Amazon. The Amazon is known for its incredible biodiversity, but also there's a hugely important earth systems change dimension about all the forest fires, all the logging, all the mining, all the oil and gas extraction. And Blue Marble Evaluation is actually playing a critical role in addressing this. So there's 11 indigenous nations in the sacred headwaters. This is an area bounded by the border of Peru and Ecuador. And they've come together around a dream, a dream of actually creating remarkable transformative collaboration to actually reimagine how to work with government how to work with civil society, and how to work with market forces to try to create a new way, a new pattern of coexistence where there is actual sovereign control over the land, but also market development in an appropriate way. But in order to do this, what they knew they needed was a system to better learn. And that's why they've contacted us and we're working with them, with the indigenous communities called Cuencas Sagradas and the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative to apply blue marble evaluation to help this absolutely remarkable dream come alive. So what's so important about the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative is this concept of a dream of transformation, of large scale change. Many of these indigenous nations were actually warring against each other. They're now coming together in new and transformative ways to envision a gift to the world of how to come together with market forces, civil society, and government to change the very nature of stewardship in the Amazon. What's so powerful about this is as we explore the entire canon of evaluation, there's actually no other method or framework other than Blue Marble Evaluation that addresses this enormous multi-scale, complex challenge of systems change like Blue Marble Evaluation. So the indigenous leaders from the Amazon Sacred Headwaters recognized this and they contacted us to assist them with a customized approach rooted in the cultural realities of this indigenous way of seeing, way of knowing, and apply methods, 
frameworks, ways of learning that helps them continue to adapt, develop, and to create this absolutely transformative dream to make the dream come true. It's really all about how can transformation be consciously realized, moving from a dream to a reality. But it takes enormous challenge, enormous effort, but they know that Blue Marble is the only answer to help them in this transcendent and enormously challenging path. One of the reasons why the leaders of the 11 indigenous communities and the NGOs working in the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative, one of the reasons why they chose Blue Marble is because the other evaluative frameworks were far too focused on just the effectiveness of specific projects and programs. It actually had a more microscopic view. It didn't, those evaluative frameworks didn't really appreciate the interrelationships to regional, global issues. What Blue Marble does is it does that in a way that is truly customized to the indigenous worldview, to the indigenous cosmology, and it allows this work to be applied in a way that's most useful to the learning and the adaptation that's needed to implement this ambitious plan. So let's keep hearing now from other members of the Blue Marble Evaluation Network. My name is Charmaine Campbell-Patton. I'm the Director of Organizational Learning and Evaluation at Utilization Focused Evaluation. And I'm also the manager of the Blue Marble Evaluation Network. We have over 600 members from 80 different countries. And we worked as a team to synthesize the independent dialogues coming into the Food Systems Summit this year. As part of that synthesis, we identified the need to amplify the voices of traditionally underrepresented groups, in particular, smallholder farmers, women, indigenous people, and youth. The theory of transformation that emerged out of that work made engaging and centering those perspectives as core to transforming the food system. And in order to make that transformation sustainable and equitable, it has to be inclusive. That's a core insight from our Blue Marble evaluation team and a commitment that we have made. The ultimate goal of Blue Marble is being a meaningful and useful tool that help those that wants to transform systems in a meaningful way. And by meaningful, I mean in a positive way for humanity and, and the planet and the livings on the planet. I would say that Blue Marble Evaluation aspires to be a useful tool for those that wants to transform our world for the common good. If someone were to ask me, um, what's your job title? I always feel a bit weird saying I'm an evaluator because I see myself as being much more than that. I do and have always seen myself as being um, a social change agent. I'm, I'm here uh, to make the world a better place. I am here to improve something. I am here to help someone. I am here to, to, to make things better. So the Blue Marble evaluation in using their, you know, the, the whole idea of transforming something, their transformative uh, principle, uh, is how I also see myself as an evaluator. And without question, Blue Marble Evaluation has changed my life and my work and my commitment to what I do. It's essentially a call to action that gives me, gives me a sense of purpose and a sense of action. It is with great pleasure that I hand this back to a dear friend and colleague, an inspirational genius around the field of evaluation, who's really the father of Blue Marble Evaluation, Michael Quinn Patton. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Glenn. Glenn joined me as I was writing the book and became a major contributor to the ideas that are in the book, uh, as did Charmaine in working with me uh, throughout the writing of the book and the launching of it. And so, I feel deeply indebted to them and the others who you've heard from who are helping make Blue Marble Evaluation a reality. I have children and grandchildren, and the future of humanity on Earth is what's at stake. We want evaluation not to be part of the problem in taking a narrow project perspective that can actually do harm 
in trying to bring about major systems transformation by its narrowness, but to bring a holistic, dynamic, complexity, systems thinking approach to major transformation because the future of humanity on Earth is what's at stake. And evaluation can contribute to that and can make a difference if we do it right. But if we don't get it right, there is no second chance. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. And evaluators have to be able to be part of that solution, part of bringing about those changes rapidly, significantly, in a major way, so that all of us are able to ensure a more just and sustainable future for all of humanity in the future. Even when we go about doing our job and thinking about what we do every single day as an evaluator, a facilitator, a teacher, um, those blue marble principles are constantly in the back of my head to think about what can I do today, what can I do tomorrow that is going to bring about a change in the world. And even if that is something really small, um, if there's hundreds of blue marble evaluators and maybe thousands and hopefully one day millions of us making those kinds of decisions, that will be a huge impact uh, for our planet. Evaluation grew up in a world that the mantra was plan your work and work your plan, a model of command and control, that we're in charge, we can make things happen. But what we're learning in this dynamic, turbulent world is that no one's in charge. We have to be adaptive, we have to be agile. And evaluation was slow uh, and actually conservative in its approach to change. What developmental evaluation did was speed up that reaction to changing conditions, which we've seen tremendously in the pandemic. And those kinds of changes, being able to adjust, agilely adapt, requires principles. There aren't detailed rules and prescriptions about how to adapt to rapidly changing conditions, but you still have to be anchored in something. And what Blue Marble Evaluation is anchored in are principles of connecting the global and the local, of dealing with the realities of the Anthropocene, of integrating the ways in which initiatives are designed and implemented and managed and funded and evaluated in an ongoing basis, not a pure sequential basis. And that those principles of looking across silos, of being savvy about what's going on in the world, of acting with urgency, and of keeping the eye on the prize of transformation, not defaulting back to narrow kinds of command and control project thinking, but to work at transformation itself, on transformational trajectories, because the future of our planet being at stake, we have to be able to think rigorously and globally and in integrated ways about how we're going to, to make those changes that will lead to this more sustainable and just world. That requires being deeply grounded in principles that we adhere to, that we pay attention to, and that direct the actions that we're taking in collaboration with the change makers themselves. So we're the first generation, the first generation in all of humanity that actually understands both the power and the benefits of growth over the last hundred, maybe thousand years, but we're also recognizing what that growth and globalization has actually done for the life support system on this planet. This is a blue marble inquiry. The challenge is for people to understand that this is a emergency. Even though it's emerging slowly, the evidence for it is overwhelming. And to get that mindset that this is an emergency and we all have to contribute is part of the message of blue marble evaluation. Not slow as you go, but get the best information you can to take the most effective actions in real time because time is running out and we need to do what's effective in the time that we have to create tipping points towards a more sustainable future. Old, traditional, narrow forms of evaluation can actually interfere with that global perspective by being overly prescriptive, overly rigid, not adaptable, not emergent, not real time. 
And so what we're doing is working with people who are committed to bringing about major transformational changes and need a transformational approach to evaluation to accompany that journey. And that's what Blue Marble Evaluation does, and that's why we're finding alignment between what they're doing and what we're doing as a way of supporting those major changes. For me, the key difference is between doing a, a standard evaluation where someone says, I would like an outcome evaluation um, that uses mixed methods, and, uh, or I would like a realist evaluation or outcome mapping. Um, there's very particular steps and ways of doing something so that when you get to the end of the report, people are pretty much reading what they expect to read. Right? They asked you to do X, and you're telling them about X. Um, they asked you for insight on why, and you're giving them insight on why. Um, with Blue Marble Evaluation, you kind of don't know what you're going to be giving them at the end, because what you're doing is you're using the principles of Blue Marble Evaluation. You're using a way of thinking in evaluation that might bring about um, findings or actions or a way to advocate that wasn't envisioned in the very beginning. Um, and to be honest, that can be challenging, right? Because your client is expecting you to say, uh, you improve livelihoods, so you should continue funding this. They're not expecting me to say, oh, you improve livelihoods, um, and by the way, you're increasing plastic in the ocean by 10,000 tons. Could you please use something else like that's biodegradable? So I think that the ultimate goal uh, for Blue Marvel Evaluation is to become a useful compass and a useful uh, tool that help those that that are actively transforming our world for the common good to navigate the complexities of, of that endeavor. And let me reiterate that Blue Marvel Evaluation is not just a, a collection of tools or a method or another uh, evaluation, you know, uh, evaluation collection of tools. Blue Marvel Evaluation is very much rooted on, on principles. It's, it's actually a principles-based approach so those principles aspire to, to be this meaningful compass for, for those uh, that are engaged in, in these meaningful transformation efforts. These principles are timeless, will be continued to be developed, but they will la outlast this generation and support the future generations looking to learn how to respond to a rapidly changing Earth system. Having been at this for 50 years, it's very satisfying for me to see how there's resonance with these ideas. The ideas are not original with me. I stand on the shoulders of people who've come before with the new generation of people you've been hearing from who are asking new questions, who bring their new values together. I feel very humbled to be part of a larger movement that is taking new thinking to about how we bring about transformational change and coming together to make sense of this. I'm part of the instrument of that in writing and helping make applications of it, but it is a collective, collaborative exercise with, as you heard, people from around the world working on this together. And I feel honored and privileged to be a part of that network. I'm not the center of it, I am a part of it. Uh, I articulate and write about some of these ideas, but that comes from the colleagues and the people in the network who direct our ideas together. That's what makes this a living network, a forward-looking network, is it's a collaborative exercise. We certainly want to welcome anyone who is thinking along these lines, who've been inspired by the people that you've heard from, to join us uh, as Blue Marble evaluators, as Blue Marble designers, as Blue Marble managers. Uh, we're all evaluators. We do it systematically. We do it with, with passion and commitment. And we invite everyone to think globally, act locally, and keep that image of our home, that beautiful Blue Marble, in your mind in whatever you're doing. I'm Michael Quinn Patton. I've been at this for 50 years. I want to welcome any and all of you into this network for the next 50 years of our collective work together. I won't be here, but we need you all to carry on for the future of our world.
Thank you.